Disney and Marvel Studios have challenged me to represent the quantum realm in a terrarium for the upcoming release of Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania, and this is what I've made. Quick disclaimer before you watch the video. The content you're about to see contains a paid promotion, which means I have been compensated by Disney and Marvel Studios for creating this YouTube video. Thank you. But what is the quantum realm? In the Marvel Cinematic Universe, the Quantum Realm is a subatomic world accessible through shrinking to a microscopic size. It is described as a place where the laws of physics do not apply and time and space become irrelevant. The Quantum Realm has been depicted as a source of power and a key element in the story of Ant-Man, where it plays a crucial role in the film's plot. This, of course, gives me the perfect opportunity to make an incredible terrarium. And in this video, I'm gonna show you exactly how I made this. So the first challenges I faced when making this terrarium was finding suitable hardscape features and figurines because they are the most important aspect. My agent sent over a link to the board game crisis protocol and within that the figurines were perfect for this terrarium. The problem is they're not painted and I'm certainly not the person to do that. However, my editor, Hayden paints miniatures in his spare time and this is exactly how we did them. Thanks Ben. My name's Hayden and I am Ben's general cave dwelling camera goblin slash editor. So yeah, Ben asked me to paint some official crisis protocol miniatures and to create a scenery piece suitable for a terrarium but befitting of the quantum realm. So I said, yeah, you know, maybe. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm, kind of, I'm quite busy at the minute. Got that book, I'm reading that book at the minute. So no, yeah, no, I will definitely do it, please. I, I have nothing on right now, I have nothing. Moving on from there, I had a little look at the box art and read the instructions carefully, gathered some of my tools, uh, including these clippers, a file and a craft knife. And of course, do be very careful with these tools. They are sharp. You can cut pieces of your fingers off with these. This box comprises of four miniatures, and that's an Ant-Man, a even smaller Ant-Man, a wasp, and an even teeny, a tiny, teeny, teeny, teeny wasp. Now for the tedious step of clipping, cutting, filing, arranging, grouping in a way that promotes order because we can't let chaos prevail, leading to the quantum realm falling to the forces of nihilism, can we? No, maybe, I hope not. Now we need to carefully glue the models together and not our own fingers, gloves are recommended. Now the miniatures are put together, we can move on to the priming stage and this means that all the paint that we add past this point will stick to the model and hopefully stay there. And we're going to be using a technique that I've learned about in the last year called Zenithal Priming. And that refers to the sun's zenith or zenith, depending on where you come from. And that's where the sun is highest in the sky. So we're generally creating an effect of being lit from above. It's highly recommended that you wear some gloves to protect your hands from the primer, a mask or even better, a respirator. And I've gone for the extra step of wearing some eye protection. Once we've got our Zenithal Prime, we're going to be using some acrylics. We'll be using some box art and some pictures of Ant-Man from the amazing new trailer that Disney and Marvel has sent us from Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantum Mania, so we can be as lore accurate as possible, which is very, very important to me. Add some highlights and add some teeny tiny detail on these absolutely insanely tiny models, especially um, the tiny, tiny Ant-Man. We're gonna be dry brushing on some metals and dry brushing on some highlights. Now the painting stage is over, I'm gonna spray these with a sealant, which should mean that it's waterproof and UV proof and all sorts of proof. And then after that, I'm also gonna use a varnish over the top. And when that's all dry, they should be protected from the humid environment of the terrarium. Also, the acrylic isn't going to react with any water in there and get into the environment of the terrarium, hurting any of the biological life in our micro-quantum world. Moving on to the terrain, I measured the terrarium, came up with a plan based on these measurements and some images that I'd seen of the quantum realm. I also wanted to create a bridge or a sort of plinth for the miniatures. 
I found some polystyrene from an old sewing machine box, cut that down to size to sort of a general ruined bridge look and put that all together inside the terrarium so it fit in this sort of general way based on the amazing sketches that I'd done earlier. I then cut down the cork bark pieces, built the scenery piece inside of the terrarium using modeling compound to fuse the pieces together, but also sculpted the modeling compound. When this had dried, I took the scenery piece out of the terrarium so that I could work on it further. I decided to have all of the light source coming from inside the wormhole vortex thing. From here, we want to add some crazy vibrant colors. So I used a mix of different paints here, and I think this effect worked quite well. After this, I used a dry brush to kind of pick out some of the cork bark elements. Now, as with the figures, we're gonna to wanna to protect this from the humid environment of the terrarium. So we're gonna use a sealant again, and then we're gonna further protect it with a varnish and just really, really hope that it goes back in. The bridge will snap. Okay, all right, that's in, and I'm just gonna make sure it's secure. Now the hardscape is in, the next thing I'm going to add in is the soil. This is a bag of black lava rock, and this is Kodama. Both of these are bonsai soils, and the reason why I'm using bonsai soil is because I don't want to introduce much organic matter into this terrarium because that's gonna increase the chances of mold. Also, the terrarium is going to be sparsely planted so that there aren't gonna be that many plants in there. And the plants I am going to use are going to be mosses and epiphytes. The bonsai soil is gonna lend itself very well to those plants. And I'm gonna go in with a layer of this and to top it with the lava rock. Now, there's a reason why I'm topping that with the lava rock. Lava rock is extremely porous. Moss loves to grow on lava rock because lava rock has that amazing water retentive yet well draining quality. Because it's a porous rock, it's gonna wick up and hold on to lots of water, but it's not going to stay saturated. By topping our substrate with the lava rock, it's gonna create a perfect environment for moss to grow on. We love moss in terrariums. My favorite kind of moss to use is Vesicularia montagni. And what I like about it is that it has a horizontal growth habit. So we're gonna place this at the front of our terrarium and it's gonna spread really nicely to create that nice carpet in the prime real estate of the terrarium, which is this front part. It's important not to over plant at this stage because these mosses are going to grow and they'll look a lot nicer in a few weeks and months time if we don't over plant them now. This second type of moss I'm using is called Vesicularia fer ferreri, weeping I believe is how it's pronounced. Now this is a taller kind of moss so I'm going to again sparsely plant this but a little further back. You can see why it's called weeping because it has these lovely long strands of moss. And that is going to be placed just at the back here. Okay. Next, I'm gonna give this a water because I don't want the moss to dry out. What I'm using now is actually distilled water. Um, and the reason why I'm using distilled water is because it's not gonna leave stains on the glass. As always, when making a terrarium, I'm being very mindful not to over water because there are no drainage holes and if we overwater, then the plants are not going to like it and it's going to become an anaerobic environment. This is Begonia Dodsonii. So I'm just going to go in with a few cuttings to start with. If at the end I need to add more, so be it. Begonia Dodsonii takes the cuttings really nicely. So all I have to do is just plunk this into the lava rock. They have quite delicate stems. Okay, so the second plant that I'm going to use is this very small leaved Peperomia emarginella. And this has a stem like glass, but you can see just how beautiful these leaves are. 
and they're so tiny. Yeah, we'll get rid of that, that looks good. Okay, so to finish off the unusual plant list, in here I have this Selaginella and Sinita, which has that beautiful iridescent glow to it. The way Selaginella grows, it grows very quickly, but it shoots out all these really long roots in, in the humid environment. And I'm hoping that this is gonna fill some of that vacant space in our terrarium. Look at that iridescent glow. Okay, before this goes in though, you can see that this has very long roots and it's not gonna be good practice just to rest those roots on the surface, so they have to go. Final plant I'm using is this petite, incredible Anubius pangolino, which is another aquatic plant. And it doesn't get much bigger than this. And the reason why I'm gonna use this is because there's a little hole in the bridge and I noticed a few lava rock pieces fell into it. The wasp is going to go in just there. You can watch Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantum Mania in cinemas now. I'm really keen to hear what you think about the movie and this terrarium, so let me know in the comment section. As always, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.